When the Americans were here, were you and your men attacking this base a lot? Yes, many times we attacked this base when America was here. We did operations. We were using IEDs. The Americans had their helicopters, weapons, and tanks on the ground. But we Mujahideen resisted very well. It's our belief that one day Mujahideen will have victory and Islamic law will come not to just Afghanistan, but all over the world. We are not in a hurry. We believe it will come one day. Jihad will not end until the last day. Thank you for tuning in to the Removing Barriers podcast. I'm Jay. And I'm MCG. And we're attempting to remove barriers so we can all have a clear view of the cross. This is episode 57 of the Removing Barriers podcast. And in this episode, we'll be looking at Afghanistan, a spiritual perspective. And we'll talk about what happened in the light of scripture. Joining us for this podcast is DW. DW is a recurring guest. But we also have a special guest, David. He's a former member of the German military and spent a little over six months in Afghanistan. David, a special welcome to you. And DW, thanks for joining us once again. It's good to be back. Thank you, sir. Great. 20 years ago, the U.S. was attacked by what we believe and know now to be Al-Qaeda and members of Islamic terror groups. As you look back 20 years, what do you remember? Where were you? What were you doing when you heard this news? And what emotions were dwelled up or came out in you? I was in Washington, D.C. at the time. I had already gotten out of the military. I got out in 2000. I'm a former Marine. and I was actually supposed to be in a meeting in a office for one of our clients, probably about three blocks from the Pentagon. And I'd called in sick that day. So I missed the meeting. And then my roommate at the time was all excited, called me into the living room and I'm watching what's unfolding and then saw the hit on the the Pentagon and was completely flabbergasted. I didn't really know what to say. When it was discovered that it was Islamic terrorists, I was angry. I was ready to go back into the military. I had never been in war, even though I'd been in the military for eight years. Only four years of that was active. I'd never been overseas, never been in war. But at that particular point in time, I was ready to go back in the military. I would have gladly gone overseas. So... Those were some of my feelings at the time. I was really blown away by the fact that something like this could actually happen to the U.S. How about you, Jay? Oh, man. Uh, all right. So I was a junior in high school when 9-11 happened. I was going into my pre-algebra slash trigonomics class, dual enrollment class that I was taking at the time. And because the teacher wasn't an employee of the high school. She was an employee of the college. She had to unlock the door every morning. And so we would just wait outside the door. And she came running down the hall. She's a little short, stocky lady and running down the hall. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Turn the TV on. Turn the TV on. So we unlock the door, run in, turn the TV on, and we see the towers smoking. Well, one tower was smoking at that time. And all of us were just, I mean, DW used the word flabbergasted, just goodness. It was a dream. Like, what exactly are we looking at here? We stared and we gawked and we were soaking up every single word. The news anchors were reporting every single update that came in. And while we were watching the North Tower, obviously it was on fire, but we couldn't see that from the TV. We could just see it smoking. And then we saw the South Tower. Yeah. And at that point, the teacher pretty much freaked out and said, okay, we have to turn this TV off. We're traumatizing everyone. Okay, let's try and get some work done. Obviously, no work got done that day. I can't remember if we were sent home early, because from what I remember, the entire country was in a state of alert and shock. Many children were sent home early. I do not think that we were sent home early. But when I got home that day, there was no playing around. There was no watching cartoons. There was no normal afternoon activities. We were glued to the news and just couldn't believe it. And two years after that, I enlisted. 
and served, knowing full well what we were signing up for. Didn't know the extent, what it would really be like to actually serve during a time of war, but fully aware. And just like DW said, I felt angry, rage almost, very angry, very indignant, very emotional to see the imagery. Even today, every year on the anniversary of 9-11, I will go back and I will watch those newscasts. It's like it happened yesterday for me, and I feel very much the same way every time I see it. What keeps me in check and what blows me away is that I could feel all the rage and indignation and frustration I want, but those people that hijacked the planes and deliberately flew them into the tower, it blows me away that Jesus died for them too. And I'm no better than them. And so that helps me pull back a little bit because you could let that anger swallow you up. And so, oh yeah, yeah, that's pretty much my experience of it. One thing that I didn't clarify, but I thought was pertinent to what I was saying there is I was not saved at the time. Mm. And so even, you know, I didn't get saved for another six years, roughly six years. But anyway, even looking back on it as a saved person, like there's been a temptation to be, you know, upset at it. But like Jay said, I've often thought the same thing. Like these are people for whom Christ died. Mm -hmm. I've thought about how awful it is that Osama bin Laden is now dead. He can never hear the gospel anymore and he'll be in hell for eternity and how awful it is. I know there was a young man in our church academy at one point that was going to be a Marine sniper and he was talking about how excited he was to use the 50 caliber sniper rifle. I remember. Yeah, he was going to Afghanistan mm -hmm. and I just was talking with him and I said to him, you know, just remember that when you sight in on that Taliban soldier or whatever, the moment before you pull the trigger, that person could still hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. The moment after you pull the trigger, if they weren't saved, they're in hell forever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he stopped and just really paused because what an amazing thought. I don't say amazing in a positive way. I say it in a very sobering way. But anyway, I just thought I would add that, you know, when I had those feelings, those thoughts about what was going on with 9-11, I wasn't saved at the time. So there was a rape that I felt as an unsaved person that now is tempered by the fact that I personally received the gospel and that I would you know, desperately wish to take the gospel to these people. David, as a German-born, I'm assuming, because for me, as a Caribbean person, I didn't have that strong emotions like Jay and DW had. So let me get you in on what were your emotions like and what do you remember about 9-11? Um, I definitely remember where I was at the time. I was a teen in high school and we had the five-day school trip to Great Britain, London. And at the time, we literally visited the big city of London and all the skyscrapers around us. And then we heard the sirens and everything, and we didn't understand this. So one of our teachers talked to some guys, and police forces then were more and more present on the streets, and we had to break up our tour. And then we found out that there was an attack in America, but we didn't know any details. And the teachers were trying to distract us with, oh, let's do this and here and there. And only later, I think it was two days later, I went back to Germany and in school and with my parents later on and the German news as well. We found out that there were planes into the towers of the World Trade Centers and that many thousands of people died. And now that I look back with a Christian point of view, I was not safe at the time, and I didn't feel emotionally attached to that country. I didn't know someone from there. I didn't know their culture, what they are, and how to describe in words that I'm not a person without empathy for others when they suffer, but at that moment, I can't remember that I was feeling anything about them or both ways. Like the angry part, I understand now. But also the sad part, I, I didn't feel anything. I was overwhelmed, I guess I would say. I was too young to understand or comprehend all those information at the time. Yeah, I fully can understand your sentiments because for me, I remember where I was. I was actually being interviewed by two Americans at a Christian radio station for my very first job because I had just graduated high school that year and I was looking to start doing some college work and I wanted a job to help pay for that college work that I was starting. And I remember they were constantly getting up, going to a different office, 
And I remember one of them coming back and say, I don't know what's going on in New York. And I remember, I didn't know what's going on or anything. I was like, you know, why is it that they uh saying something going on in New York? Then it wasn't until I actually finished the interview, got the job, and then I went to the bus stop and I got on the bus and the radio was playing. And I realized, oh, there is planes flying into buildings in New York. But that was like a world away for me. Yeah, as you said, I didn't know anybody, you know, in New York that basically was injured or anything. I, it was really a world away for me. So I can't remember if I had any real emotion towards it until maybe a month or two later, I was in a bus and there was this girl that I went to school with and someone was making fun of it. And she gets so upset. Mm. And then she said that her mother was actually worked in the building. And she was asking, well, what would happen if my mother was there? But fast forward to about 2006, when I came to the U.S. for college, then that was the first time I realized how significant and how painful and how hurtful this was for the U.S. Mm. I never comprehended until I actually stepped foot on the soil and really see American response to this. And I realized, wow, this was even much bigger than I imagined it would be. I knew it was big because all the airport procedures and security procedures have changed. But I just thought, hey, they're just trying to prevent it. But the impact and the life loss and the loved ones that didn't come home and stuff like that, and honestly it didn't hit until I experienced it in the U.S. for the first time. So that's my remembrance and my experience of it. Thank you guys for that. Let's get into this. Now, we know why America went into the war, why they went into Afghanistan. Do you want to expound on it a little bit more? Initially, I don't think the U.S. understood who was responsible for the attacks. And then that's why initially President Bush at the time, President George W. Bush, said in his initial address to the nation, we're going to find out who did this, we're going to hold them responsible. But when it came out that al-Qaeda was responsible and that they had safe havens in Afghanistan, then they declared that they were going to go into Afghanistan. But the way that he described it, the way that he declared, he didn't declare war. He called it a war on terrorism. At the time, I don't think anyone noticed or anyone cared, or at least I didn't. I was a senior in high school. I think I said I was a junior earlier, but I was actually a senior in high school. And we just thought, we don't care. Just go in there and get the ones who did it. So he didn't declare war on the country itself or on the government. He declared war on terrorism. In hindsight, that was such a broad and vague thing to say because terrorism, particularly Islamic terrorism, can be so nebulous. It changes. It's very adaptive. It's not the same every single time. They got groups popping up. You kill one, two more pop up. And so he set it up pretty nicely for a multi-year engagement. But at the time, the country was unified and in agreement to go in and go after the people who did it. And so that's something that we probably need to unpack because he didn't declare war on Afghanistan. We call it the war in Afghanistan, but he called it the war on terrorism, which I think gave him and anyone in the leadership leeway to go after terrorism wherever it was thought to exist. But it also meant that it didn't just have to be Afghanistan. That's probably why he could tie it and justify going into Iraq as well or whatever country they felt like they needed to go into. So... David, why do you think the West went into war? Being someone from Germany, from the German military, why do you think the West had to go into war? Not that I know a lot about the American history, the American reason for going there. But from my point of view, it was to find those who did evil to the country, America, and bring them to judgment. That was my understanding. That was all over the news that they were looking for the person, the leader, Obviously, there were many, many people involved in this attack. Finding the person who was responsible for the planning and for, for everything behind the scenes and bring them before the judge. Or terminate them. Exactly. Okay, so I think Osama bin Laden was found and killed in 2012, I think? 10. 2010. Then we stayed there another 10 years. So, DW, let me bring you in on this. The why. Because if it was like David said, hey, we're going to find those who are responsible for it, bring them to judgment. Why is it that we're only coming out now in 2021, 20 years later, rather than 10 years ago? Yeah, quick correction. He actually was killed May 2nd, 2011, actually. 2011, so 10 years later. Mm -hmm. 
So the reason that we actually went into Afghanistan, according to George W. Bush and so forth, was because the Taliban, which was in control of a good portion of Afghanistan at the time, was they declined to extradite Osama bin Laden right. and those that were deemed responsible for the attacks. So we went into Afghanistan with the idea that we were going to bring Osama bin Laden and those that were associated with him through Al-Qaeda and so forth that were actually responsible for the attack. So it wasn't just Osama bin Laden that we were after. It was really sort of all of Al-Qaeda. And then because the Taliban refused to actually extradite him and assist us, then we sort of destabilized the country by even going in. And so we felt like we couldn't really leave it in that destabilized state. Mm -hmm. So I think the reason that we stayed there longer was because we were hoping to stabilize the country in some manner. You know, there's that idea that if you go in and you kill or you take out or you bring to judgment the big bad warlord, then somebody is going to take over in his place. There's going to be this vacuum of power and somebody's going to take over and maybe they're going to be worse than him. So I think that's also part of the reason that we stayed was because we were hoping to stabilize the country. And that's the reason that we stayed longer than we intended to, I presume. Yeah, let's flesh that out a little bit because... As we think about the war in Afghanistan, a lot of folks will say maybe it's a failure or maybe the U.S. should have left earlier, as I alluded to. So firstly, do you think this was a failure? And if so, what did America do wrong? And not only does America, but the West, because our allies were in there as well. So flesh that out a little bit, because if we want to bring stability to the country, what should we have done differently is my question as well. I think that we bit off more than we could chew. You know, I mean, it sounds like a nice little package to say that we were going to go find Osama bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda leaders and take them out. But it became quite a larger task than that. And so one of the things that I think that we did wrong is that we went into it so hastily that we didn't really fully understand what we were getting ourselves into. Mm -hmm. Right. So David, as the only former military who have fought in Afghanistan, What's your thought on that? What do you think the West did wrong, or even America did wrong? And was this a failure as you look back on it? I knew the question, but it's still hard for me to find the right words to describe my point of view about those things. I was there 2013, 2014, and it was not just America was there. At some point, many, many more countries joined the task to help fight against Taliban. And if I remember right, at my arriving in Kabul, it was 35 nations. I have a picture of 35 flags on the Kabul airport who were there present and thousands and thousands of soldiers. And everyone had probably different information about why we are actually here. Now, from a Christian point of view, if we, for example, make a big meeting and one person gets saved or we spend thousands and thousands of dollars, this one soul is worth all the costs that we did that this person be able to hear the gospel and receive Christ as the Savior. Amen. If I can relate this to a war, that we, we as soldiers, as many, many countries, join together to fight the big, bad, evil person, and we were able to, to find that person, neutralize, and bring a little bit of peace into it, maybe even establish democracy or train those who are willing to be police forces or even military forces in this country to be that policeman, let's say, who takes care about the bad people, then I would say we try our best to help them. But if people are involved, it's never good enough, I would say. It's hard. There's so many viewpoints coming in all kinds of directions in this moment. And yeah, I'm sure if my answer is satisfying enough. Yeah, I like the direction you took this because as I think about it, there's this gentleman who said that one of the big problems is that we send soldiers in to fight and we destabilize the country and we bring peace in a mm. sense with the gun and with force. But yeah. then we leave and we don't send missionaries in or we don't have missionaries come in alongside that. Now, the direction I'm going here is that that sounds good. But to me, it will take generations for folks to get saved, hearts to change and the country yeah. to go in a new direction. And but not only that, the politics that's involved here, because if, let's say, the West has decided, hey, we're going to send in Christian missionaries as well to convert these people, the politics that that will 
bring as well it's like okay so you're not trying to get the bad guy anymore you actually try to convert these people from a christian perspective how should we handle this should we actually send missionaries in with the soldiers or should we say it's going to be too political so let's leave this out of it dw <laughs> <laughs> well i don't think the two are actually i mean in the sense that the u.s military went there to bring justice to this situation i don't think that is necessarily mutually tied to sending missionaries there like i don't think that's the job of the u.s government to send missionaries there but if that would have opened a door for us to send missionaries there we certainly should have taken the opportunity to do so you know when hudson taylor went to china and started the inland china mission it had nothing to do with a war or anything like that so i don't really see the two as being connected in any way whatsoever the u.s military went there to do a job if that would have opened the door for missionaries to go there and bring the gospel there, which I think it did in some cases. And I think there actually has been, there's an underground church in Afghanistan. So I think that did actually open somewhat of a door for that, but I don't see them as being connected exactly. Yeah, I would agree with some sentiment there. Let me play devil's advocate here and say, so if our goal was also to stabilize the country and bring democracy, and I believe that democracy in some respect is a Judah Christian culture. I don't think you get democracy out of, honestly, Islam. And I don't think you get democracy out of many other cultures that don't have a Christian foundation. So if our goal is to bring democracy there as well, because that would probably be the most stable structure, why is it that we wouldn't want to send missionaries in as well? Well, Canada is also considered a country that has founding principles based on Judeo-Christian values as well. But it was actually the Catholic Jesuits that actually helped found the country more than someone that would actually be Christian as such. So, again, I don't see stabilizing the country and making it a democracy as necessarily being tied to evangelistic missionary work. I see them as being exclusive, actually. They could be related. I mean, David and I were talking earlier, and I was sharing with him that Thomas Jefferson was highly unlike he was actually a saved man. He was probably a deist at best. And he based many of the founding principles of the United States actually off of Baptistic principles, which, yes, are biblical, but Jefferson himself was not necessarily a saved man. So I don't see that being tied distinctly to Christian missionary work, if you will. So I don't see Christianizing and then also bringing a democracy into an area as necessarily being the same thing, although a democracy may be based off of Judeo-Christian values. I'm not sure if I'm making sense, but hopefully I am. Oh, yeah, definitely. I just want to add, in many ways, throughout the years, after we went into Afghanistan and subsequently into Iraq as well, we kept pushing this idea of winning hearts and minds, winning hearts and minds. And almost indirectly, one could make the argument that that's what the government at least the U.S. government was pushing for. You're not going to win hearts and minds through military force. So even if they weren't trying to bring the gospel to these countries, and I'm just linking Iraq and Afghanistan together because they've both been used as excuses to justify being there. You know, if the president is talking about winning hearts and minds, it's clear that he was trying to do something more than just go in there brute force and take out the enemy. He really wanted to try and change it from the inside out by changing people. But you're dealing with people that have millennia in terms of history of not just the Islamic religion, but before Islam came and established ironclad rule in these areas, people were all sorts of faiths, Buddhist and all these different things, a bunch of Sikhs in there as well. You're not going to go in there with brute force and change these people's minds. They'll acquiesce because you've got a gun, but they're not going to change who they fundamentally are. And it was John Adams who declared that the Constitution of the United States was only made for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And I think, of course, many people would try to paint Islam as a peaceful religion, but even a cursory understanding of Islam will show you that it's not. Even if you were to say 20% of Islam are the hardcore Islamists, you know, convert or die types and 80% of Islam is not, that other 80% is likely to be okay with what the Islamists are doing. 
And so we're kind of fooled into thinking that somehow, particularly in this country, we're fooled into thinking that somehow Islam is a peaceful religion. The problem was what they realized is that the Islamists will kill you for the faith, but everyone else outside of the ring of the Islamists will be like, well, you know, he had it coming. They won't condemn it. Very few of them will actually condemn it, which means the religion as a whole is an immoral one. It's not one which is suitable for democracy because very much similar to communism, the Islamist way of doing things is that that government is their God. They enforce and they instill everything and you have to submit to them. It's very similar to communism in that way where the government is God. Roughly same idea, although I know those two are not the same, but they're similar in that particular way. I agree with DW in terms of biting off more than we can chew because we go in there wanting to change hearts and minds and they don't even have the underpinning for it. It was a fool's errand. To me, it seems like the purpose America went in and the purpose the Taliban and Al-Qaeda thinks the way they are different. I think the U.S. maybe went in to bring justice because of what happened in 9-11 and to seek those that have caused this evil and bring them to justice. Also, I was listening to a CNN interview with one of the Taliban, and they were basically saying in a nutshell that this war is not a physical war to them. It's basically a spiritual war, and they're going to fight to the end. They're in it for the long haul. Until, and this is what he said, until basically the whole world becomes Islam. So to us, we are going there, we're going to bring them to justice, maybe stabilize the country. But to them, it's like, hey, we are doing this not because we want Western values or we, they're trying to put Western values upon us. To them, we are trying to change their religion. We are trying to change their way of life, their culture. Even recently, I was looking on one of these websites, one of these news websites, and they were saying that the Taliban gave a warning to America not to interfere with us, our culture, when it comes to the treatment of women. And of course, this can open another kind of worm in terms of the way women are treated in the West to the way women are treated there. But again, it highlights to me that they are looking at it not necessarily from a physical point of view, but also a cultural, and more importantly to them, a spiritual point of view. Yeah, and as Jay was talking, I I started thinking of this analogy. Going in and trying to establish democracy without the, as she called it, the underpinnings, the Judeo-Christian values, and so forth, you know, established with the people themselves, it's sort of like sending someone to an AA meeting. The AA meetings in the States are loosely based off of biblical principles, but they're doing it without actually seeing the person converted to biblical Christianity. They're trying to have the person adopt some semblance of moral biblical values without actually being converted to a Christian, without actually coming to know Christ as their Savior. And it actually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The person might stop drinking. And they might stop doing that for the rest of their lives, but it actually doesn't change anything fundamentally about them. And so, you know, if we would have tried to go over there and institute democracy in Afghanistan, and in some measure, I think we sort of did that. But as soon as then we left, we were the stabilizing force, if you will. As soon as we left, as soon as America left, American troops specifically left. The country destabilized and went back to Taliban control. I don't know if I'm sort of meshing with some of the thoughts that have been already given. But yeah, I think that's why we didn't succeed there. And I don't think we could have because we didn't fundamentally change the people. And and like MCG was saying, they were resisting was Mm -hmm. the fundamental change. And they couldn't actually adopt democracy without that fundamental change, honestly. And they weren't planning on doing that to begin with. Yeah, it seemed to me like we were attacking the fruits rather than the root. Sure, yep. Answers in Genesis has this illustration where they have these two castles on the foundation of the one castle says biblical Christianity and on the foundation of the other castle it says atheism, but we could replace it with anything else really. And then on the top of these castles on the parapets, the towers of these castles, they've got these balloons with different topics on the Christian castle. It's got, you know, creationism, inspiration, etc. And then in the balloons on the atheist side, it's got evolution and Marxism maybe or something like that. And each of these two castles are firing cannons at each other and the Christian castle is firing at the balloons on the atheist castle and the atheist castle is firing at the very foundation of the christian castle Mm -hmm. so the war that we're fighting is fundamentally different we're attacking 
the topics and they're attacking the foundation. We're attacking the Islamist terrorists that attacks the United States and so forth, and they're fighting a war to take over the world. Yeah, so what should we have done differently then? I think all of us here agree that this was a failure. And in my mind, I'm wondering, is there a way that we could have succeeded? In my mind, I'm like, I don't even think so, but let me throw it out to you guys. What should we have done differently? Because this is so complicated, and the roots and the web of this run so deep and tangle so much. What should we have done differently maybe would have given us some sort of success? Or have we seen success already? I mean, we killed Osama bin Laden, so if that was our goal, we succeeded in that. We didn't fundamentally change the country. We maybe in some way left it off worse than we went in and found it. But I think there should be a distinction made between the American soldiers that went and maybe their goals than the leadership of the United States. Oh, yeah. Great point. The American soldiers went in to help people. And they did that. They succeeded in doing that. Maybe not permanently, but they went in to try and help people. And people, at least for 20 years, have been helped. So, you know, there's been a whole generation that's grown up in Afghanistan that has seen the benevolent hand of the U.S. military, if you will, because these individual soldiers went in to be a help to them. I mean, you can see pictures as the American troops are withdrawing and some of the American troops were left in there, they're pouring water into the mouths of these Afghanis and still trying to help them. You know, so when we say that it was a failure, I don't want to, with this broad brush, just sort of paint the American military with this negative stroke. The soldiers that went there, the Marines and so forth that went there, they went there, like David said, they went there to help. So from a leadership standpoint, was it a failure? Absolutely. From an individual military standpoint, there were some Afghanis that actually ended up being able to leave the country and come to the United States and have now taken up residence in the United States and other countries and are leading a better, fruitful life because we went there. Yep. So there were some things that we did that were pieces of success, if you will. Did we totally succeed and whatever? Obviously, no, unfortunately. But there were successes along the way. Oh, definitely. There was a thought coming up in my mind. If someone comes to me and let's say destroys my home, the home of my family, the home of my friends, and the same person, the American, later on helps me to build it up, I feel a little bit dumb from an Afghan point of view. Because why did you bomb my house in the first place when you want to help me build it up again? Is maybe a bad reputation in some Afghan hats in mind that, hey, the American is destroying everything and then try to build up our home according to their image, what they believe is right. Because I remember we were talking with certain people and they were asking where we are from because they didn't recognize the German flag on my shoulder. Said, I'm from Germany. Where is that? Is that somewhere in America? I said, no, I'm not from America at all. Then they liked me. They showed sympathy towards me because I'm not American. Certain people, if you say you're American, there's automatically like, ah, almost like a hate kind of relationship mm-hmm. towards you. And yeah, in that way, I would say we failed because we came in, we destroyed a lot and we didn't give them the information. You know, we did this for a purpose because we heard that let's say in this house complex or whatever, there were some bad people trying to kill others, maybe even you. And if we don't give them the information that we did this for your own good, others might come in and give them the wrong kind of information. Oh, the American, he wants to destroy us. Come on our side. And then we fight them back. kind of. Right. So, oh, it's so important that yeah, the right information is exchanged. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I think your perspective as not being an American is very important because I have a similar perspective. Because when I look at it, as I said, I never realized how much of an enemy America has and how much they love at the same time until I move here. Because if you think about it, the West, but America in particular, has a lot of enemies. They're hated by a lot and they're loved by a lot. And the ones that love them, love them. And the one that really hate them, really hate them. And yeah. I think that's, as you said, in Afghanistan, when you were there, you see the same thing. So I definitely, but going back to what DW said, because I think that was great because, you know, one guy much smarter than me said that basically paraphrasing that 
war is actually an extension of politics. And I do believe that the many fine military folks that we sent in went in there to do good. And I think they did do good. And I think many of them succeed. But politically, definitely, this was a big failure politically. And this is not just Bush, nor Trump and Biden. This was under Obama as well. All these presidents, I think, had a hand to play that caused this failure. Not only that, but we also have to look at Congress as well, because they're partly in this too. Because from what I remember in 2001, there were only one member of Congress that didn't vote to go into Afghanistan. And this became more than just a war to find justice, but it became very political. And I think if you separate it based upon what the fine Marines and soldiers and sailors and whosoever else were in there did, and compared to that to the police, I'll definitely agree that the military did a fine job and probably most likely succeed more than fail. But I think the politicians failed way more than they succeed. You're listening to the Removing Barriers podcast. We're sitting down with DW and our special guest, David, and we're talking about Afghanistan, a spiritual perspective. We'll be right back. Antivirus software protects you from malware. But to protect your privacy and security on the web, you need a virtual private network or VPN. Did you know that Ivacy offers an easy-to-use VPN app for each of your favorite devices? From Windows, Macs, and smartphones to smart TVs, tablets, and browser extensions, and even gaming consoles. Get Ivacy for your choice of devices to secure your connection, browse with privacy, and access content from anywhere in the world. Go to ivacy.com or click the link in the show notes. Use coupon code Removing Barriers for a 20% discount. We have touched on some of the spiritual aspect of this. Dive deep into, well, I don't know if deep, but deep for me into some of the reason why we may have failed, we may have succeed. But as a person who was born and raised in the Caribbean, I remember growing up. And we will say often that America believe that they're the police of the world. They feel like they should go in and do this and do that. I'm going to show this to you, David, because since you weren't born and raised in America as well, I wonder, was that ever a sentiment in Germany that you feel like U.S. was acting like they're the big bad police of the world? And if so, to everybody, should the U.S. be the police of the world? Yes, I heard the term a lot that America is feeling that they have to go wherever is a problem to try to enforce peace. Many times there was something happening southeast, there's something happening in, in the West or anywhere in the world. And at some point, Americans were involved and that always gave, not that we had the right kind of information. There's always some kind of missing on the way. And I think that we always were asking the question, why is America doing this? Why is always America involved? Because Usually when America is involved, something bad happens. That <laughs> kind of an haste it had towards us, in, in Germany at least. So let me bring you in DW. As a born and raised and red-blooded American, what do you think about this? Well, I was thinking about this podcast. I was talking with my son a little bit. And one of the things I said was, well, you know, if one of our neighbors was being attacked by some person, like, wouldn't I go outside and try to stop that? And he said, sure, but, you know, if our neighbor is doing something voluntarily that's bad or wrong, is that your right to go over and stop that? And I thought, hmm, that's, uh, you know, an interesting perspective. And so should the U.S. be the world's police? No, because that's not our job. But at the same time, if one of our neighboring countries is something is being done wrong to them, should we try to go help? Should we intercede? I think it depends on the circumstances, but maybe, probably. It's kind of a case-by-case basis, honestly. In this particular scenario in Afghanistan, I think the reason that George W. Bush had us go there to take out Osama bin Laden and hopefully Al-Qaeda, you know, I mean, somebody attacked us. If we didn't do anything in response to that, then we would probably in some measure open ourselves up to additional attack. But if we 
responded with appropriate force, hopefully we would deter or lessen the likelihood. But does America think that we're the world's police? I think in some manner we do, and I don't think that we should think that. I'd agree. Although I struggle with this, to be honest, because I'm thinking of, for example, a country like North Korea, where the people are living under terrible conditions, under this tyrannical leader, and he's got a foot on everyone's neck, and he is God in that country. And I've listened to many stories of people who have escaped, people who have defected, and I just can't imagine living like that. And something in me burns like, oh, we have to do something. So I totally understand both sides, but I really don't think that America should or is even capable of being the world's police. We've already done that many times, spreading ourselves way too thin, unable to accomplish what we set out to do and hurting ourselves in the process. So yeah, I would say that we shouldn't be the police of the world. We simply can't be. But I think with Afghanistan, It's my personal opinion. This may not be true. It was more than just going in there and getting a hold of bin Laden and, you know, trying to right the wrong of 9 11. Afghanistan is actually a very strategically placed nation. It shares borders with China. It shares borders with all of these different countries where it would benefit us to have a foot of some sort or hold of some sort in Afghanistan so that if something goes awry, we can launch from Afghanistan. So I don't know what the leaders were thinking. I don't know what Congress was thinking. I don't know what the military industrial complex was thinking. But I suspect that because Afghanistan shares a border with China, there was very strong interest in getting a foothold in there so that we could, I don't know, perhaps one up or at least be prepared to one up China because we've haven't always been on friendly terms with China and other countries. But that's pure speculation. I don't know for sure. So that also complicates things because it's not just about justice at that point. Now we're talking about political chess, worldwide chess, to see right. who can be the top dog in the world. So yeah, well, the extension of politics. Right. But as I think about that, let's go a little bit deeper because what's going through my mind is this. And I could be wrong on this, but you guys can let me know. It seems that America doesn't have a problem, and I'm going to use this word, beating up on countries that are much smaller, that are much weaker than them. Because the argument can be made that China is doing really bad things right now. Russia is doing really bad things right now. North Korea is doing really bad things to their people. But the West is not going into these countries because these countries can meet America force with equal force. Mm. And we're not going in there, but we're going to Afghanistan because we know that these people that we're wearing flip-flops <laughs> and running around with AK-45 or AK-47, that they can't, <laughs> they can't match our power. So we will be the police to Afghanistan, but will we be the police to Russia? Will we be the police to China or be the police to North Korea? Is it because they have enough military power to match us? Maybe not North Korea. Or is it truly that we have a moral values that we want to push? Where am I going wrong on this, on my thoughts here? Well, I think the idea of going in and changing a country and turning it into a democracy, or at least a peaceful country, that kind of thing, is actually one of the ideas in which the, and I could be wrong here, but it's my understanding that that's one of the ideas in which the UN was sort of founded on, was that we need to make the world a better place. And the way to do that is to spread, I wouldn't say that they would say democracy necessarily, but maybe a more of a socialistic perspective. But through socioeconomic change, we'll make the world a better place. So that's part of the reason, or part of the thinking at least, but why we haven't gone into China and Russia and so forth, I think absolutely you're you know hitting on the right idea that those countries can meet our force with equal or greater force and sometimes, you know, maybe even combine forces and would create a larger problem for us. And so that's maybe why we don't go in and police those nations. I don't know that we would necessarily go into Afghanistan because they're weaker. I don't know that we would go into that country because of that, per se. But we probably would evaluate and say, you know, are we able to effectively do what we're hoping to do by going in there? And I think that was our hope. 
But again, I think we've been off more than we can choose. So maybe I've gotten off in a little bit of a rabbit trail here. But I think the U.S. would like to see the rest of the world become more democratic and more friendly and so forth to their benefit, possibly. How about you, David? I'm curious of your thoughts. I might quote a movie and not actually a good one, but with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. I know for sure that America is capable of doing great things. I've seen it. And military-wise, I think is one of the top three, maybe the best of the world. When it comes to using the right power at the right time, I think it is important to use it for the good things. And if America is capable of not maybe policing, but helping other countries to establish peace, I'm all for it. When would it be good for them to go in and not go in? Though I think, and maybe that takes us off the topic of Afghanistan, but should 51% of that country be for the U.S. coming in? I mean, how would the U.S., if they were going to do or use that power, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. If they were going to use that power responsibly, how would they know when to go in and exercise that power? And so I guess in some ways it would almost be easier to say, let's just do or not do. But I think discerning when is the right time to go in is, is hard. And maybe that was part of the problem in Afghanistan. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Would there have been a financial aspect to this as well? Because, you know, maybe oil, maybe precious metal in terms of would that play a role in this as well? I've never heard those particular thoughts as motives here. I mean, I have heard some conspiratorial kind of things to suggest that, you know, certain things behind the attacks on the towers and so forth may have been prompted or staged or something to that effect. But I find those theories to be somewhat hard to palate. Maybe that's because even though I know that people are not inherently good, I find it difficult to believe that Americans would stage something so devastating against their own country in order to create a circumstance that would benefit them. And even if that were true, I just kind of hope it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying that the planes flew in because of financial issues. I'm saying maybe the U.S. went in also because of financial issues. Oh, I mean, did we look at it and, and look at the other gains that we would get by going in there? Sort of like what Jay was saying as far as the borders and so forth and the access that that would give us. Sure, maybe. I've never really read anything that would suggest to me that that was the case. I don't think that the people that are in military power in the United States or political power in the United States, they're not dummies. So, yep. Let me spin this question a little bit because I think we could also ask the question this way. America, or at least Christians in America, are very proud of the fact that the country has Judeo-Christian underpinnings, was founded on biblical principles, and for many, many years, maybe even a century or so, really stuck to those principles. And only in recent years have we begun to shy away from those and opt for other godless options. So earlier we were talking about Bush and his hearts and minds idea going into these countries, trying to change it from the bottom up. We were talking about missionaries going in. Let me see if I could pull all that together and ask the question, is this a question of theonomy? Is this a question of two spiritual positions vying for position? Like the Judeo-Christian ethic trying to go into an Islamic or Islamist setting and trying to establish the rule of God or Jesus Christ's rule there. Because we talked before about how the Taliban and many Muslims along with them, not just them, believe that they are fighting a spiritual war. They're in it for the long haul. They are in it to win it until the whole world becomes Islamic. And we as Christians, we want to see the whole world won for Christ. Of course, not through military means, but we also want to see the world won for Christ. Everything that we're seeing in the news, everything that we're discussing now, is this just the facade and what we're really talking about are huge spiritual battles in the background? Is this a question of theonomy? I would say maybe. And the idea, again, that those like the UN and so forth, the idea was that you know through political change and social change and so forth, the world can be made a better place. So I think 
maybe from that perspective, but is it truly a government with its head as Christ that's against the Islamists that would have you know, Allah as their head taking over the world? I don't think so. Honestly, I mean, some might have that view, but from the standpoint that there's this idea that we could make everybody like a Western civilization and therefore make the world a better place. I do think that there is that idea. I think it's very prevalent, actually, in the U.S. and in some European ideas as well. I wouldn't see the U.S. as actually being a Christian nation that's going to take over the world and make the whole world a Christian world. I, I don't see that. You know, I will agree with DW and say maybe as well. And I'm actually saying maybe, but leaning yes. In some ways, the reason why I say maybe is because I believe Islam is false. So whatever they believe is going to happen in the end times and the second coming of the imam or the seventh, what do they call it? The seventh, is it the Prophet? seventh imam? Yeah, the seventh imam. I think. Whatever they believe about that. Yeah, it's the twelfth imam. Yeah, in the Islamic belief system, the twelfth imam is going to return. I'm going to use a big word here. In eschatology, the Quran and the Bible both have eschatology. And the word eschatology literally means the study of the end times or the beliefs about the end times. And so both the Quran and the Bible both have eschatology in them. And the simplest way to explain the eschatology between the similarities and differences between the two is this. The good guys in the Bible are the bad guys in the Quran, and the bad guys in the Quran are the good guys in the Bible. So the 12th imam, according to the Quran, the 12th imam is going to be a religious leader. They're going to set up a caliphate, which is Islamic State, and under the rule of the 12th imam, that 12th imam is going to return with Jesus Christ, according to Islam. And the Jesus of the Quran is going to point to the 12th Imam and say, he's actually the guy, the Mahdi. And so in the Bible, this would be the false prophet and the beast. And so the one that's claiming to be Jesus Christ is going to be the beast. He's going to be the one that's the political arm. And then the false prophet, the 12th Imam in this case, is going to be the religious leader. So the eschatology in both is actually very similar, but sort of like a mirror image of each other. Right. And as I said earlier, that in their mind, this is a spiritual war. And I think to some degree, it is a spiritual war. And it is. Oh, it absolutely is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To some extent, they're looking at end time to say, hey, we need to do this for the 12th Imam to usher in the 12th Imam. But as Christians, we know the true ending and the true way this world is going to come to an end and Christ's return. So is it a question of theonomy? Again, I would say maybe, but we have read the end of the book. We know who won. So, Yeah, but does that absolve us as Christians that have the ability to do something, to do something? Does that absolve us of the responsibility to do something? Because uh, we're talking about people who want to bring about the Islamatization. I just created a new word. The Islamatization of the entire world. And we've seen what happens to countries when they come in and they enforce, what do they call it, Sharia law, right? completely antithetical to everything that we believe as Christians, as Americans, as whatever you want to say. It's just completely antithetical, and it brings about death. And so this is why this is a hard question for me, because what, do we just kind of stand here and take it? I'm not sure I would agree that we would, you know, just kind of stand here and, and not fight back and not engage, if that makes any sense. But then we're not the police of the world. But if we allow Islam to just spread and infect, just grow like cancer and just spread, will it get to a point where they're able to subdue or to subvert the U.S. because they're just simply greater in terms of military strength, in terms of the land that they've taken over, their resources that they've taken over? I'm not sure that we should just stand back and allow that to happen. The next question here is, are we morally obligated as Christians to counter Islam with the gospel? And if so, do we do that with war? I don't know. That's a tough question for me. I don't think we should do it with war because that's not the example that the Lord Jesus Christ has set. We're not revolutionaries as individual Christians. But if we like to say that we're a Christian nation, or at least we were a Christian nation, do we have that obligation? I would harken back and say, you know, sort of what I touched on earlier in that Thomas Jefferson, one of the primary writers of our founding documents, was not himself a Christian. I would argue that we've never actually been a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. We've been a nation that has had maybe biblical values. So in that sense, Christianized or Christian-like 
in some sense, but we've never actually been a Christian nation as such. And, you know, I would hearken to the Baptistic principle of separation of church and state and say that should Christians fight Islam with war? And the answer is no, because Jesus said to his disciples when he was headed to Jerusalem and the Samaritans saw that he wasn't going to stay in, in that Samaritan village, James and John said, should we call down fire from heaven like Elijah did and destroy them? I'm badly paraphrasing. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, you know not what spirit you are of. I came to save men's lives, not destroy them. And so should Christians take it upon themselves to respond with war or violence? Absolutely not. The answer is no, unequivocally no. But the nation of America is not a Christian nation, never has been. It might be Christian-like or have Christian values in some sense. But the nation as a whole, I think, does have to respond to threats to it. Like I was saying before, if, if we didn't respond and do something about the fact that Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda attacked the United States, then we would just open ourselves up to further attack. You know, if another country, North Korea or China or something, actually decides to try and attack us, if we don't do anything, they're just going to continue to do that, and those things are going to escalate and so forth. So as a nation, yes, America has to respond and defend itself, but that's not a Christian defense. Mm -hmm. and you know, should we fight Islam with the gospel? And the answer is yes, but the gospel isn't war. The gospel is actually good news, peace, <laughs> peace with God, peace from God. And so I wouldn't even really say that we should be fighting Islam with the gospel as such. We should be taking the gospel to the world and the Lord can change people. I guess the best analogy I could draw here is a few years ago, I was talking with this husband and wife, Jerry and John, and they were asking me if I would come with them and hand out pro-life literature mm. at train stations. And after talking with them for an extended period of time, they were both Catholic. And after talking with them for some extended period of time, I said, and Jerry, I think her name was Geraldine. That, that was the wife. I said to her, I said, Jerry, I'd be more tempted to take tracks and try to witness to people than I would be to take pro-life literature and try to hand that out to people. And she looked at me kind of quizzically and she asked me why. And I said, well, because if I'm handing out pro-life literature, I'm attacking this topic. Whereas if we could see the whole country converted, let's say, to Christianity, to actual biblical Christianity, that would solve the pro-life issue. Yep. And that's the difference between true biblical Christianity and conservatism. Mm. Yes. So, I mean, you know, should we fight Islam with the gospel? That's kind of weird terminology. Mm. I would say we should take the gospel to those people. And then in seeing them come to Christ, that'll solve the Islamic problem, if you will. And there's also, we should be an example. If you see, for example, those Talibans who stands for Islam, how violent they are, how they like kill people wherever they go, and they make no difference between men, women, old, young. They do what they think is right. And if you, on the other hand, have this Christian who wants to talk in love with patience, and shows true love towards another person that, hey, I don't want you to go to hell. Why? Because I love you. That makes a huge difference, I believe. Oh, yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that. Oh, yeah. As David was saying that, I thought of Harlan Popov and being tortured for his faith, or maybe it was Wormbrandt. But anyway, I think it was Harlan Popov. As he was in prison, I think, for 14 years being tortured and so forth, the soldier that tortured him, the man that tortured him for all those years, eventually ended up coming to Christ, and he said something to the effect that the reason that he ended up coming to Christ was because the more he tortured Harlan Popov, the greater Harlan Popov loved him. Oh, wow. And so, like David was saying, if we could be an example to these people of what true biblical Christianity is, which isn't attacking them of war so much as it is you know, bringing to them and being an example to them of Christ's likeness. I mean, I'm not talking about lordship salvation here. Right. Our life should reflect the Savior that we supposedly claim to know and worship and, mm -hmm. and love and adore and have, you know, who saved us. Yeah, and as you guys were talking about that, I was thinking that, you know, the unique thing about Christianity, though, is that you cannot force true biblical Christianity on anybody. It has to be a willing reception of the heart. If that didn't happen, you're not converted. Your sins are not forgiven. But in many other religions, including Islam, I think, that you can force this upon them, or at least you can force 
the lifestyle upon them. I guess you could argue that you could force Christian principles or so upon people, but that's not what as Christians we're trying to get. That's right. We're not trying to get people to conform. We try to get them to transform by the renewing of their mind, turn to Christ. We're trying to get a turn in. Mm. By force, by might, we can get people to conform, but the Bible teaches that we want a transformation. We cannot do this by force. Even if we want to see Afghanistan and the whole world evangelize, we have to do it through the love of Christ by spreading the gospel and not by force, because quite honestly, it doesn't work by force, as the Bible teaches us. So let's wrap it on up with this. Is there any hope for the Afghan people? And if so, what is that hope? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think praying for those Christians who are still in Afghanistan, that they are able to preach Jesus Christ boldly before the people, even if it is in secret or not, or on the streets, whatever is possible. And what we can do here is praying for them. That's our weapon. And you're saying that we should be praying that they would have an opportunity to preach the gospel either, you know, in these underground church services or even in the streets as the Lord would provide them. So what is that gospel that they would be preaching that would be the hope of the Afghan people? Absolutely. So that will be an undeniable fact is we will all die one day. But the question everyone has to ask himself is, where will you go after you are dead? Is it heaven or hell? And the good news is Jesus Christ has made a way to heaven for us. And this is how you and me, we are all sinners in the eyes of God. We are not perfect, not holy, and only perfection can have entrance into a perfect heaven with a perfect God. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Committing sin means you are a sinner and like a prisoner. He on earth has to go to jail. A sinner will stand before God after his death to receive his penalty, the second death. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Maybe whoever is listening right now, you think, but I'm not that bad. I haven't done as bad as so-and-so. But the Bible says in Revelation 21.8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars mm. shall have their part in the lake which burn from fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This place is something you don't want to ever, ever experience or go to. So how can I change it, you might ask? We have to admit that we are sinners. And we deserve punishment for our wrongdoing, for our sins. Okay, that sounds bad, I know. But here comes the good news. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God not only said that he loves us, but he showed his love, sending his son Jesus on the earth to die for our sins. Jesus is perfect and sinners, and the perfect payment in the eyes of God for our sins. He took my place, he took your place, and paid it all, so you and me don't have to go to hell. With his ultimate sacrifice at the cross of Calvary, his burial in the tomb, and his victorious resurrection after three days, he paid for the sin of all mankind, mine and yours. Eternal life in heaven is a free gift for you, which did cost Jesus everything. And this now is the key moment. Once you know and accept it, that you're a sinner, that you deserve hell, and that Jesus paid it, so you don't have to go to hell, then you have to accept his gift of salvation. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Accepting his gift of eternal life is a matter of the heart. You have to pray, God, Forgive me of my sins, and I accept Jesus Christ's payment for my sins and for my only salvation, that he is the only salvation I can have. 
David, DW, thank you so much for joining us on the Removing Barriers podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks. I've enjoyed being here. Thank you for listening. To get a hold of us, to support this podcast, or to learn more about Removing Barriers, go to removingbarriers.net. This has been the Removing Barriers podcast. We attempted to remove barriers so that we all can have a clear view of the cross.